The church. What is the church? We're come, we've come here to worship Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. That's why we're here this morning, because of the work of Christ on the cross for us. He died for the church. Yes, he died for each one of us individually, but he also died for each one of us collectively to be the body and the bride of Christ. We've been studying the church. Last week we looked at what is church membership, and we defined the church as the local body of believers, like-minded believers, in Christ who are united to worship and serve the Lord. The church is symbolized as the body and the bride of Christ. And to be qualified for membership in a local church, we need to first receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We need to decide to join the fellowship of believers, but also be accepted by the local fellowship of believers. Today we're going to continue this theme of the church, but our question today is, what are the responsibilities of church membership? What are the responsibilities of church membership? I hope you realize that once you accept Christ, that's not the end of your walk with the Lord. That's only the beginning. There's more the Lord wants to do in you and through you. But we have to be open and willing to be used by God. Now, does Scripture tell us any responsibilities as believers in Christ, as, as church members? Is there any biblical evidence that we can lean on that tells us how, we're to, how are we to act as a local body of believers? Well, surely there are. There's several Scriptures. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 today. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. Before we get into that, give you a little bit of the context. Jesus has died. He has uh, risen from the grave. And he met with his disciples several times over the period of 40 days. And uh, in one of those occasions in Acts chapter 1, Jesus said to, that you are going to be my witnesses in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that was a, a kind of a different take on the Great Commission to go and make disciples of Christ. Go and make disciples. Let me tell you what Jesus did not say. He did not say go and make converts. He said make disciples. And discipleship making is a lot more difficult. It's a lot more responsibility in making a disciple rather than making a convert. Making a convert looks like this. You tell them about the, the message of Christ and they believe and say the prayer with you and then they become a Christian. That's a convert. But what's a disciple? A disciple is one who studies diligently, who learns and grows and becomes a Christian who makes other Christians. They learn the proper doctrines and they put to practice what they believe. That's a disciple, one who follows now, being a convert is the first step in being a disciple, but it's not the last step. We need to progress toward disciple-making, not just convert-making. And we do that through diligent study, through teaching God's Word, and learning how it applies to our lives. Let's stand as we read our scripture today. As we see a message from Peter, after he preached this Message to thousands of people, and 3,000 people accepted Christ. And then we get this little depiction, this little summary statement in verse 42 of what the believers of the early church did. and What did, what did they look like? What was their fellowship like? Let's read this. Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the, the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together and gla with glad and sincere hearts 
praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Fathers, we come before you and we hear your word this morning. I pray you would speak to us clearly. Speak through me and to me, Lord. Help us to hear your word clearly in our lives. Use me as your vocal cords, your mouthpiece, your weapon of righteousness today. Lay me aside, Lord. And I pray you would help us to receive your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There are several responsibilities given to us in Scripture, even just from this passage. We're going to look at a few today, but it won't be the exhaustive list. We'll continue this responsibilities list in the coming sermons. But in, in general, church members need to be devoted Devoted. Devoted to what exactly? Devoted first to the apostles' teaching. To the teachings of Scripture, verse 42. Just like the early church, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. The actual verbiage of this phrase means to identify yourself with the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching because they identified themselves with the apostles' teaching which is what we have now as the New Testament text. And to identify ourselves with the apostles' teaching, it implies a few things. It implies that we trust the Scripture as the truth. You trust the Scripture as the truth. But it also means that you desire to learn the Scripture. You trust the Scripture as the truth, but you desire to learn the Scripture. That's what it means to be devoted to the teachings of Scripture. Then lastly, not only do you trust and desire, but you obey. You obey what you have learned. Do you trust God's Word as the truth? We've talked about this in Sunday school, but I'm going to talk about it again. I've heard many people say, even recently in conversations, that Scripture, as we have it today, has been lost in translation. I, was, I got in a conversation about this with somebody recently, and I just asked them, well, how do you know that it's been lost in translation? And I get a comment like, well, I saw a guy on a YouTube video. Mm-hmm. Well, how do they know it's been lost in translation? Well, he's a, he's a scholar. Well, what qualifications does he have? Well, he said he was. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Is that how this works now? You see, the, and I told this person, I said, well, we probably want to uh, not take someone's word for it just because they said it. Um, because there are several hundreds and thousands of scholars throughout the centuries that have said otherwise about this book of being lost in translation. So we probably want to gather all the evidence that we can, then make the decision, and not just take some person's word for it. But no, the Bible has not been lost in translation. Because further, if you press the issue with somebody who questions that, and you say, well, can you give me an example? You will often be met with silence. Because they can't give you an example. Why? Because they don't read the Bible most often. Sometimes you'll get someone that's really smart and they'll give you an example to which we need to be able to have some answers to that because there are reasonable explanations to places that are troublesome in translation. But overall we are confident that we have the right text today. Because the evidence for the reliability of scripture is so vast and expansive. This Bible has been true, proven true throughout the scrutiny of thousands of years. But yet his still stands. It has proven itself trustworthy and reliable. It is without contradiction. It is true in all that it affirms to be true. Now I'm not saying there are not places in Scripture where, where it is trouble with translation. There are certainly places in Scripture where it is troublesome to figure out exactly what the original writers were intending to write. But if you have a study Bible or a reference Bible, you can go and it'll have little asterisks or footnotes explaining 
that little phrase or that word, and it'll say something like this. Well, some early manuscripts have this word or this phrase, but later manuscripts have this word or this phrase. So we don't really know which one were the in, in the original writings, but it may be one of these translations. And it's not problematic, and that constitutes about 1% of the text of the entire Bible is within that kind of a margin of error. So we could say the Bible that you hold in your hands today is at least 99% what we believe to be the original writings. And I'd further say this, we have about 6,000 manuscripts of the New Testament alone. We have no original documents of any ancient text, biblical or otherwise. But we do have 6,000 of the New Testament alone manuscripts. Now, in early documentations of, of writings, people would not just copy things if they not, did not believe that it to be true. Because copying took a lot of effort. And you know how, how we as humans are. We don't put forth effort unless there's a good reason to. All right? So they believed it to be true. They believed it to be life-changing. And so they copied it very fast, and a lot of them. And that's why we're finding more and more manuscripts all the time. And that's a test of historical reliability, the number of manuscripts. Not only the number of manuscripts, but the time period by which the manuscripts referred to the original documents. So let's say, you know, uh, with, with Paul's writings, Paul wrote in the 40s, 50s, and 60s A.D. But we have documents in the first century within 50 years of when Paul actually wrote. That's a, that's, that is incredible as far as historical verification. Matter of fact, the only thing that can really compare to it is you may have heur heard of Homer's Iliad. This was written way before Christ. But the earliest document that we have of Homer's Iliad is somewhere between 400, around 400 years after Homer died. 400 years as compared to 50. Not only that, we only have about 1,700 manuscripts of Homer's Iliad versus the 6,000 of the New Testament. Another test of historical reliability. So scholars are confident to say that we have about 99% of what we believe to be in the original text. But there are still some translation issues. I'm not going to lie to you there. But we know where the problems are, and they're often noted in your Bibles. But I will say this. Here's the kicker. I love this. Even if you are like, well, I don't know if I can trust the Scripture. Okay, let's say, just for example this, let's say you just deleted that 1% that was problematic. Okay? You just deleted it from Scripture and pretend like it was never there. Don't advise doing that, but let's say for this example you did. What would you lose? You would actually lose nothing as far as Christian doctrine is concerned. You would lose nothing. Christ still died for your sins. He is still Lord. He is still King. He still rose from the grave. He is still ascended into heaven. He is still promised to come back. And He is still, the only way to be saved is through confessing and believing in Him. All major Christian doctrines remain intact, even if you deleted it, all the problematic pieces in Scripture. So really what it boils down to is, do you believe in the Lord? Jesus Christ. And we believe that we have the, the reliability of the New Testament text and it can change our lives if we believe in it. Scripture is worthy and trustworthy because it has proven itself even as it's been scrutinized. Do you trust the Scripture? Do you believe it? And if you trust it, we should learn it because we believe that God's the scripture in its entirety is God breathed. It is God inspired. God wrote this book. He authored this book. He used humans to do it, but he authored it. It is trustworthy. But once we've determined that it's trustworthy and inspired, do you desire to learn it? Do you desire to learn the scripture? It is God's word. How much interest do you have in learning it? If you believe that this is God's infallible word, how often are you reading it? How often do you care to read it? 
How often are you hearing it? How often are you being taught it? Do you desire to learn the Word of God? He wrote it for you. He spent 1,500 years constructing it. He sent His Son to die for you so you could have it. He unveiled Himself to you so that you could learn more about Him. He cares about you. How much do you want to know about Him? Now, suppose you have someone special in your life. Someone you love very much and they went away on a trip. Or you went away on a trip for a long time. And the only form of communication was writing a letter. And so after being away a while, you, you received a letter from your loved one. How would you treat that letter? Nonchalantly, would you say, oh, look, a letter from who so-and-so. Well, put it on the shelf. Maybe I'll pick it up every now and then. I mean, you haven't spoken uh, to your loved one in a long time, and so you know, they wrote a lot. Okay, let's say they wrote several hundred pages of a letter. All right. But uh, would you pick it up every now and then and like, just read you know, a sentence every now and then? Now, if it's truly somebody you love, you'd be really intent on learning and, and, and reading what they had to say because you care about this person, and you know they care about you. And so you would be like day in and day out reading it with greatest intent, with great care to learn what they're trying to say to you. That's how we should treat God's Word. Because that's what He did. Spent all this time to and care to carefully construct His Word. To give to us. But yet we treat it as nothing special sometimes. We put it on the shelf. We pick it up every now and then. We don't immerse ourselves with it. The only way to really learn it is to read it. If you have trouble reading, you can listen to it. You can hear it. You can be taught it. There are tools out there to get to know God's Word, but how much do you care to learn it? Your, your desire to learn God's Word is really reflective of your desire to love God. Your desire for God is reflective of how much you desire His Word. God loves us so much that he carefully constructed this book. Charles Stanley said, No, it's not easy to understand. If it were, you, do, you would only ever read it one time. <laughs> and that would be enough. But it is, so, it is just complicated enough and intriguing enough to where we, we are forced to dive into its mystery. Y'all know, you know, you know what it's like to, to watch mystery movies or, or a TV show or a mystery novel if you're into reading. You're immersed in it. You can't wait to see what happens next. And so you're like, oh, trying to figure it out as you read and go. Well, the scripture is often like that. You're not going to grasp it in your first go. It takes time, it takes meditation, it takes prayer, and it, and it transforms your life. It takes dedication. But it's worth it. Because as we draw close to God, He draws near to us. And He reveals more and more of Himself to us as we get in tune with His Word. What good is it in learning Scripture? Scripture is our sword, the Bible tells us. Jesus used Scripture to defend off the attacks of Satan. You remember that in the desert when Jesus was tempted? He used the Word of God to defend against attacks of Satan. So to, to memorize this book is, is important. But even if you memorize this book from cover to cover, but you never applied it to your life, it means nothing to you. There are, I'm sure there are some people on this earth who have memorized this book cover to cover but yet it has not made an impact on how they live. If we truly believe this is God's Word, it will change us from the inside out if we let it. It needs to be a transformative experience as we dive into the Word of God. It should change our outlook on life. It should change our actions and our words. It should change our attitude. 
God uses his word to speak to us and cut to, cut to the heart. But we have to be open and soft enough to receive it. The truest mark of receiving his message, his word, is by obeying what it says. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commands. Period. Not only were they devoted to the teachings of Scripture, but they were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to fellowship. How devoted to the fellowship are you? As church members, one of our responsibilities is to meet together. To meet together. Fellowship. Uh, in Hebrews, oh wait, look at our primary text today. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. I hope, you under, I hope you're catching the togetherness of the early apostles and, and the early church. They were together all the time. The word for fellowship translated in our text today is the Greek word kionoia which means close mutual association with one another. This fellowship is highlighted by the rest of the passage and shows us what togetherness means. It is mentioned at least three times in this five verses. But true fellowship means togetherness. True fellowship means togetherness. This kind of fellowship extends to every aspect of life. The early believers did everything together. They ate together. They worked together. They worshipped together. They hung out together. They lived life together. Could you describe the church today as being together? Of course, culture is a lot different now than it is then. But true fellowship is togetherness. But also, true fellowship means sharing. It means sharing they shared together. Look at the text. It says, they shared with those in need. Anyone who had a need, they met that need. They would share their expenses to give to those in need. They sold property and possessions to give to those in need. They would support one another as they're down and struggling. Now, I can imagine the church was headed in the right direction in the harmony God intended for his church. They shared their resources, their time, their energy, their faith. And they made every believer a family member. You know, America, we live in a, what is called a guilt-innocence kind of culture. A guilt-innocence culture. What this really means, and you see it in practice today, we really emphasize independence and individualization. You can see that. We emphasize independence and individualization in our culture. However, as believers, we need to be interdependent on one another. To be believers together. Because independence can be hazardous to Christian fellowship because you think you can live life on your own and do things your own way and, and try to live your Christian life by yourself. Well, no man is meant to be an island, as the song says. No man is an island. No man is supposed to be all by themselves. We are to carry each other's burdens. We need one another. We need one another. We should take care of one another and carry each other. But let me be careful in saying this. Because I'm definitely not advocating that church members should take advantage of the generosity of a church. And that the church should pay your bills. That's not what I'm saying here. Now, if you're in a great need, of course, we will help. But the church is not to be taken advantage of. We give and support one another because we love one another. But you see people all the time, and I get phone calls from people all the time not, that are not church members. They'll call, on, they'll call the church and say, hey, I, you know, I'm really in need right now. My, my family is so-and-so. I'm left all alone. I'm, my phone bill or my power bill's due tomorrow, can you help me? And a lot of it's just a scam. It is just a scam to abuse and take advantage of gener the generosity of churches. And it's a sad culture we live in, but that's the state of the culture we live in. And 
our church is not going to put up with some of that. But we are to be generous. We are to be kind. We're also to be wise and discerning as well. But we take care of our own here. We support one another. Because we are, we are family. Just as God intended us to be. Matter of fact, listen to what Paul said to the church of Thessalonica. Because there were some people there in the city and in the church of Thessalonica who were just kind of taking advantage of the church and being lazy in regard to taking care of their own personal responsibilities. And he said in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 13, it says, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive, and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We are not idle. Paul's using himself as, the, as an example. He says, we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this, not because we do not have the right to such help. In other words, he's saying, yeah, we would, de- we would deserve to be paid for, for our work. But we did not assume that, that privilege because we didn't want to be a burden to you. We wanted to be a model, an example for you to, to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. Listen to this. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some of you, among you, are idle and disruptive. They are not busy, they are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing good. There are some people that do take advantage of churches and generosity. That's not to say there are, aren't people that are in genuine need, that need help. But we are called to take care of our own thing and take care of our own responsibilities as we are able. But we also to live life together as the unity of the body of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 10, the author of Hebrews says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. All the more as we see the day approaching, the final day. Because there were some people in that early church that tried to live life all alone. They tried to live life by themselves, away from the church. They thought they could live their Christian life away from the body of Christ. That's not how God intended it. He intended us to be together. And there were some who were were avoiding meeting together with the church. And their faith And their Christian walk was being compromised. Can you grow apart from the church? Yes, you can. Can you grow better with the church? You absolutely can. We are meant to be together. Togetherness and sharing. Being devoted to one another in fellowship. Now, you're not going to find a perfect church anywhere. I hope you realize that. But if you do, as soon as you join, it's become imperfect. (laughs) <laughs> because there is no one that is perfect. I want you to imagine a snowflake for me. We're coming to the latter end of, of winter time. But I want you to imagine a snowflake. Did you know a snowflake, there is no two snowflakes that are alike. Every snowflake is individually unique. I want you to imagine a snowflake that falls on the roof of a shed. And can you believe it? That shed did not fall. I hope you would not expect it to fall because it's just one light snowflake. But can you imagine now trillions of snowflakes falling on this roof of this shed? Now, unless this shed is super reinforced, that shed will crumble under that many snowflakes. Yeah, one snowflake didn't make a whole lot of difference. But when you combine all of these snowflakes, you can get an avalanche. 
And that's what it's like to be a part of a church. God can do a lot with one. He changed the world using 12 apostles. Plus some. But can you imagine what he could do with a whole church or a whole denomination or a whole, the whole Christian community working together under one accord to impact this world? It would be unfathomable what God can do with that kind of fellowship, that kind of togetherness. They could change the world. So we need to be devoted to teaching, need devoted to the fellowship, but also devoted to prayer. Just like the early disciples, they were devoted to prayer. We pray as our primary communication to God. How often do you pray? In the context of Acts in the early church, the people prayed together and privately. They prayed together as a community. They prayed privately in their, in their personal relationships with the Lord. We need both as part of our Christian life. We need both. Private prayer is necessary to develop that personal relationship. But we also pray with other believers because there's power and there's strength in that and there's strength in that unity. How often do you pray? How do you pray? Maybe you don't know how to pray, but you would like to know how to pray to the Lord. It's much easier than you can imagine. Just talk to God. Tell Him about your day. Tell Him what's on your mind. Talk to Him as you would a friend, but keep in mind He is holy and He deserves that reverence. Tell Him your heart. Tell Him about your day. He wants to hear from you. Tell Him your struggles and your concerns. Thank Him for things that He's done for you. There's so many things to talk to God about. We're never at a lack. Prayer is our primary communication to God. Some people express better in writing. You can write out your prayers. However, you can talk to God. When we come to God, we come empty, expecting to be filled. Broken, expecting to be fixed. We come in faith, knowing God will answer us. We come to Him as holy, nothing less. We come humbly, nothing more. We come with an attitude of repentance and forgiveness. We come to align ourselves with His will. We come because He cares. And in fact, we come to Him because He first came to us. Fathers, we come before you. We thank you for your word. We pray that you are moving in our hearts and in our church. We pray that you would draw people to you. We pray that you would help us to surrender ourselves to you. And God, I pray for anybody in here today, anybody that's going to be listening to this sermon after, if they do not have a personal relationship with you, they would establish it. And after establishing that personal relationship, to get connected to a local church where they can actively serve and be a part of the fellowship that you want us to be a part of. I pray you would do your work in us as you grow us individually and grow us collectively, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.